million dollars. There is no mid between, there is no semi good game where you're making decent profit, making your money back. Either you lose almost everything or you are gaining a lot of money in the end. So, as driving a company, you can't to game saying, oh, I want to create that game, it will make me very successful. It's all about the small details within the game team, within the game. So all of the small details inside the games are created in the game teams. That's also why I need to give full responsibility to the game teams. I basically give them a account of money and I tell them, come up with a game, make sure it's nice. Uh, whatever I give them of suggestions of what they should do will only be suggestions for the games. Even as a CEO, I can go in and tell, make that button blue, do it this way. Because what I need to create in the office and in, in, the, um, in the games we do is this sense of ownership in people. To actually make sure that they are empowered to take decisions, to make sure that they always do what's right within the game. They always make sure to question themselves because if they, if I tell them like you should do a game, it should be like this, they won't think. They will just do the game that way. If you force people to think, you force people to do random meetups. You force people in that way to become creative, and it generates in the end a much better product. It's of course a super risky process to do, uh, but it is really what it takes because. Games need to be tweaked and improved over and over again, and you need to be the owner of the game to do that. Uh, is there almost like a point where an office can be too fun, and that your employees are just playing ping pong all day, or doing boxing all day, instead of really working? Yes and no. Uh, as long as you make sure that you don't pay people per hour, and as long as people understand that they're not paid per hour, but they're paid to do a job, um, they have an ownership of, of what they do, they have an ownership of their time. They understand that we need to get up here and I'm reliable for actually getting that done. It's a tough industry, so of course, if you are playing ping pong a lot, but still generating results, I don't really care. If you're not generating results or your, your, your team around you says this guy is not really good and you're playing a lot of ping pong, you will no longer be part of my team. It's, it's a little bit tough industry in it, but as long as you can manage your own time, play the ping pong, do the lunch, uh, do the lunch also take time off. Uh, as long as you can manage your own time, you can often also manage your time, your working time and create something that is much better in the end. This is, this is something where your culture matters in your organization. So when you have a culture as a team, I don't have to sit there and worry about my, what my staff are doing. They know that they work on a team. They know, hey, dude, if I'm not showing up, Jacob's going to be like, dude, sorry for my French, but he's going to be like, what the fuck? Where's Tiwa? Right? And that's not okay. So part of it has to do with the culture of the organization. If people believe they can walk into your organization and say, hey, I can just hang out and play ping pong all day. You have a culture problem, not an office problem. Office, the ping pong, the games, these things, that's not the real problem of the root of the problem. The root of the problem has to come down to the culture of your organization. And the culture that we believe in has to do with the passion. And quite frankly, if you don't cut it, the teams will weed you out very quickly because we work as a team and they will say, dude, show up, we don't mind you playing, we don't mind you having a great time, drinking some beers in the evening, have a great time, no worries. But show up for your team. It's just like in sports, you show up for practice, you show up on game day, that's what you do, but you can also party, it's all right. Make sense? So would you say that most creative ideas that um, are brought up, are they created in office or outside of office while you're drinking a beer with your colleagues? <laughs> Do you want me to answer first, or do you want to answer first? Okay, I'll go. Um, uh, I think different personalities generate ideas differently, and so part of our dream, and I don't think we're quite there yet as Kaidi, is that we believe that great ideas can come from anybody inside the organization. So I actually don't mind that you are an intern or my, my, my housekeeper here. That doesn't matter. That person is a person, and has great, valuable input for us. So the ideas can generate from anywhere. The idea is, can you make a space 
a environment where people are willing to express their ideas. And in Thailand, the biggest problem is we are not willing to express our ideas because we're afraid of being wrong. And for me, what we're trying to create here is that everybody, please express your idea because I cannot improve my idea unless you tell me yours. And you can't improve yours unless I tell you mine. And we have to share like that because I don't know everything. I only know what I know. You know something completely different than me. If you please express it, then we can create that environment. And this is one of the things that holds back Thailand in terms of its own development, is this ex expression of their ideas. So ideas can come from any time, any place. And if you ask my team, they say, yeah, a lot of Tiwa's ideas come when he's doing <laughs> drinking beer. Uh, fully agree with Tiwa, especially on the culture. Like ideas is something that needs to become a part of your culture. I even often, how do you say, if people come up with a bad idea, but I know it will be good learning from them, I sometimes have to stay, like, go back, just so they can experience the either failure or success on their own, because you need to make sure to tell people that it's okay to fail, you need to try things, you need to experience things, you need to express yourself. Uh, worst thing would be to tell people that have an idea in a public forum like this, to kind of nail them down or to make them embarrassed, because once you have that embarrassed feeling within yourself, you stop coming out with ideas, you stop thinking, uh, you stop creating better things because you are not speaking up. Most good ideas that I come with are just by having a thought, saying it out loud, 50% of the time it's utter bullshit. The other part, it's actually something good and people can have a thought pattern that goes, uh, I would say, evolves the ideas. And I drink beer with, with Tiva, we get a lot of ideas. Like, I think the beer ratio gets you more I, more ideas quantity, not necessarily quality. That's, that's how I justify expensing my beers. It's yeah. like, no, but... It's a creative process. You just see how many ideas we came up with. Do you like it? <laughs> you want to join? <laughs> um, apart from that, personally, most ideas are, especially when you don't need them, so they will be in the shower, in the airplane, uh, best idea I had for three months came up over lunch today because I was asked the question. You need to have that interaction. You can't just sit down and say, okay, now I need to create a game. I need to have an idea. Whatever you write down is always bad. It needs to be you talk to people, you ping pong with people, and that's how you create better ideas. Okay, so lesson learned, we have to drink some beers tonight and create some ideas. <laughs> and also, best advice, get some friends that are willing to shoot down your ideas. It's horrible to have friends that always encourages you. So you come up with a great idea and you say, oh, that's good, you should do it. Best friends you can have is that I think that's all bullshit, you're wrong, because in that case you get feedback, you keep improving your ideas, you actually generate a culture between your friends to come out with ideas and try to shoot them down. Anytime I get an idea, I also need to go to somebody else and tell them, just so they can kill it. Because if they can kill it, I know it's a little bit better. And when you go through 10 people and they can kill the idea, maybe it's actually worth it to Can I add to that? So when I do have beers with Jakob, um, here's the way I know it's a good idea from the beer session, is if I wake up in the morning, I still remember it. <laughs> that means, hmm, that is still a good idea. <laughs> Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand if you have. Yeah. Yes. First, one in the back. Uh, can you speak? So before the mic gets back there. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Um, please, please stand up and state your name. Hi, my name is Kit, and um, my question is about um, as a startup. What is your most important uh, criteria that you pick and choose your staff to be your team and how you attract uh, them to, to join your team? This one's for you. <laughs> Maybe uh, both of you. <laughs> I know Tiva can talk a long time about this one. Personally, the biggest one I see in people is the ownership of failures, uh, the ownership of actually 
doing something wrong and admitting that it's your fault and still going through with it. There's nothing worse, there's nothing that kills culture more than people starting pointing fingers at each other. So whatever I, whenever I can pick people I know throughout a long time or test throughout a long time, it's that, okay, I screwed up, let's do this instead. The worst thing is that people try to get the blame on somebody else instead of owning it. Uh, so yeah, my biggest, my biggest point is actually the ownership of your mistakes and your successes at the same time equally. So it turns out uh, there's a guy, um, have you read Drive by Daniel H. Pink? I recommend it, you have, awesome. Um, and it turns out like a lot of times start, startups get stuck with the money issue. And really money is hygienic and it really becomes, money is a non-issue. The real issue is mastery, autonomy, and purpose. If you know what your purpose is and what you're doing, and the staff that you're gonna hire have that same purpose, and you give them the autonomy and the ability to master their area, they're gonna be great staff for you. They're gonna be great team. And I, I hate the word staff because actually they're part of your team. The money thing can come later. Just make sure you take care of them someday. And at the beginning, you can't. We're gonna all be eating mama noodles together just make sure someday you just take care of them. Because I've seen too many people that have left out of that situation, they believed in it, and then the ultimate side was the founders or the shareholders didn't take care, and you know what, those guys leave bitter. But those are the same people that build, help build your company, and the next time you're going to do it, they're, you're going to want them with you. So that would be my advice. I think finding those staff that are passionate with you and that you can provide them those three things. Those are the most important topics. Can I add to that? <laughs> um, I have a theory that as a company, you either need to inspire people and make them passionate to keep them, or you need to overpay them. And when you come out to the tech industry and you know competitors within tech, even in Thailand, even Denmark, you see the companies like, you either find companies that have really inspiring leaders that drive them with passion, and you have other companies that just overpay. Uh, and that's how you keep employees for a long time. I would suggest that the ones that are picking jobs based on their passion and based on their drive will always do a better result in the end, but that's the best way to retain, to retain people, uh, whatever theory fits. Does that answer your question? There's a question in the back over here. Ah. And then another question over here. All special fun. All over the place. Oh, um, my name is Joyce, and I have a question for Jiva. Um, okay, so do you need a girl that speaks both Chinese and English? And a little bit of Thai and know how to design and know social media to work for you. Please. Gaz, by the way, this is Gary, my CTO. He runs product and UX and tech. He, we keep them all together. And the reason we keep them together is because I don't believe those three things should be separated. Especially when you don't, when you have somebody as talented as this man is, please come talk to him. And yes, or if you're on the marketing side, then please talk to Katie back there or Ri, who's standing there, who's our creative director, we would love to have you apply. Thank you. Clear my... Wow, this paid off already. Then we have a question over here. Uh, let me take this mic over here. Oh, it's okay. Um, I may... Nice to see that. Um, yeah. Uh, my question is more direct to Play Lab. Uh, uh, you guys work with Infinity Lab to develop one of the games, right? And actually, I'm a fan of the, the guy who, who, who worked with you on that project. He made uh, Candy Million before that. Tom. Yep. Um, I, I want to know what is it like to publish a Thai, Thai developer game, and are you looking to do it more in the future? And you know, kind of your experience to, to work with a talented Thai developer. So this actually comes back to the questions about the ideas. Uh, when we create games, I rarely care about where the ideas come from, if they come from within 
or if they come from the outside. In, in, in the case with Rantron, it came from the outside because Infinity Level actually been working on this game for, I think, one and a half year before that? Can you give a little bit of background for that? Okay, a little bit of background. Uh, we create a game that is called Rantron uh, and partner it up or co-develop it together with a local Bangkok studio. I think they have 15, 20 guys now. So they've been working on a game for a long time uh, and we came in as a, I never used the word publisher, I use the word as a co-developer. They actually had a game that was kind of finished, but didn't really deliver the exact results that they were hoping, so they couldn't give a full growth on the market. And that's where we came in, because we had more of the expertise, uh, expertise, cast, know-how, how to spread it out for the rest of the world. So what we do in games like that is that we do in a new co-development, so it's usually 50-50. Uh, in a case where a developer was working on a game for a long time, we would pay them some cash up front for that work, and then we would invest uh, heavily into marketing, heavily into actually putting resources from our side into the game to make sure that it's among the top one percentiles, because if you're not top one games, you're not making any money, as I mentioned a few times, you need to be the top, so you need to make sure you have to tweak correctly. Um, but the reason why it comes back to the ideas is that I don't really care if it's one of my employees that comes up with an idea for a game that we take from scratch to launch, or if it's in this case Infinity Level that has an idea, they take it from scratch to a certain point where we kind of acquire half the, t the title and then take it the full way. Can you give us some, some benchmarks about, so when you talk about Ranchrop, how well did it do? Like give us whatever you can share. <laughs> I don't really, like, I can go a lot into details and up our RPPUs, uh, but top level wise, a user in today's market in US would cost around $3. If you look two, three years ago, he cost $1. But now to, to do an advertisement on Facebook, uh, as you probably see in your newsfeed, you have a game. Let's say you see Ranch Run in your newsfeed, you click on it, you download the game, I, as a developer, actually pay $3 for that if you're based in the US. If it's in Thailand, it's more like 80 cents, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. But if you are a US Facebook user, you click one of my ads, you download the game, I, as a developer, pay $3 for you to download the game. So in gaming, it's really important that, the, that I make sure that the average spend per user is more than $3. because. If I pay three dollars to get the download, and you only spend two dollars in the game, I lose a dollar. That's bad business. So the problem is that if you have a game that is making, let's say, two and a half dollar, and it costs three dollars to acquire the user, uh, you're still losing money. But it's only the last fifty cents. And if you can tweak it up to just saying that you're buying a user for a dollar and he's spending an average one point five dollars, that's when you start to make a profit. Uh, the reason why Juice Cubes grew to 25 million downloads was that a user at that time cost one and a half dollar, and we were making around two and a half dollar uh, on the average user, and that's why you can really scale the game. So where it's important in games today is that, as I mentioned several times, you either make a game that goes across user acquisition and can make a success, uh, you can of course do what I call the Flappy Bird approach and just get extremely lucky. Uh, same with Angry Birds, like you get lucky and you get on the top, but it's not a viable business model, it's not something I want to go for. I want to go for predicted growth, something that we can see that we can put millions into and millions will come out. It's a good business approach, it's good growth. Uh, so in Ranch Run, I don't remember how far we were from the user acquisition at that point, uh, and we're not even still, we're still not fully there to do the full push of what I wanted to do. Also because the cost per install has been going up like three times uh, over the last few years. Uh, in Thailand itself, it's gone up, in, in my data, it's like 15 times yeah. because there is no competition on the back then. Yeah, the games, games market. But it's an interesting point, which is like, when Jacob and I share, it's like, I go, Jacob, dude, how, how's the game? And he's like, dude, it's so hard. And I was like, I go, and I was like, but Jacob, it's, it sounds so sexy, right? It's like, wow. And he looks at me and goes, Tila, the fact that you're able to predict and kind of invest and control and, and grow, you're returning, you're going to grab new users, you're going to return them back to your consistent platform, sounds really interesting. When I look at him, I go, 
yeah, but dude, you just created a game and you just got 25 million. That's so <laughs> awesome. And he's like, yeah, but then tomorrow could do it like this. And I was like, and it's a different in business, right? Um, the way I compare it is for gaming, it's much more like the movies industry. Like you invest into a movie, you're not quite sure if it's going to work. And it's a gamble, but when it hits, it's huge. And that hit often, statistically in gaming, needs to pay for nine other games that doesn't work. And a game is around half a million dollars to, to do, so it's a lot you need to invest for that. But yes, back to your question, we are looking for more games. Uh, we are of course very picky on what we do because it's a tough market. Uh, but ever we can get from ideas from the outside, or games from the outside or inside, I don't really care. Right. So, so half of... No, I don't have. I'm just a big fan of the guy who made the Top. Penny Million. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad that you guys helped them. Tom is a great guy. Yeah. yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, why does Kaidi have to change his name for two times? What is the reason behind it? I believe it was even more than two times. But <laughs> this question is for you, John. Oh, you switched to Tiva, right? <laughs> um, the, uh, it's good marketing because we get questions like that. No, um, so look, uh, we had a lot of different uh, shareholding changes over the last four and a half years. Um, I've got significant major global players in our shareholding business, in our shareholding group. Um, there was some changes of strategy. The final piece of this was last year when we merged with KaiD. And so we were OLX, they were KaiD. KaiD didn't have a local team. Uh, what you see in KaiD today, everything is our team, our platform, everything is the same. And the board asked me a question. They said, Tiwa, which name do you want? And as hard as it was for our team to swallow, I chose KaiD. We as a team chose KaiD. And the reason we chose it was because we are Thai. We're doing this for Thailand. And quite frankly, if I choose the OLX global brand, I don't have control of my brand. But by being KaiD, I have control of my brand. And I can do my brand for Thailand. That's why we chose our final name change. Ultimately, it's about our shareholding situation. And strategic decisions that are made at a global level for large investments. So, so KaiD was a name that was made by a company that didn't have a local Thai team? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, you know the name of that company is called Shipstead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so they didn't have ship. So KaiD was selling in Thailand and they launched against us. They were competitive. And uh, we merged. And we merged in multiple markets. Uh, it's complicated, but ultimately they asked us which brand. And we decided to go with the Thai brand. By the way, it was a hard decision because we had built OLX for the previous year and spent a lot of money. And we believed in the brand and changing the team was switching, changing gears from a team that went, okay, we love Dealfish. Then they say, yeah, but now we love OLX. And then a year later they go, love KaiD. And they're like, okay, Tiwa, how many more times do you ask me to love another brand? It wasn't easy. Um, I don't recommend it, but it can be done. And I can tell you, frankly speaking, honestly, um, I think our brand, values and our brand, who we are today, is much stronger than it was ever before. Would you agree with that, Gaz? And I would also say that the culture is the key. Yeah, exactly. He, what he said was, culture is key. Our culture of willingness to change, because we know what's right for not just the customer, but also for the business, it matters. And that's where Jakob's point earlier about culture matters. I could see how dedicated you were towards changing your name by advertising and dressing up as a lady to <laughs> advertise Kaidi. Did you see that video? I don't, I don't think it's working any longer. I think, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, another question uh, from Line, uh, from Apishit. Uh, as most Thai people frequently use social media, Facebook, Twitter, or Line, um, how does this affect? Uh, the influence of on KaiD and PlayLab on their marketing strategies, the, the social media boom that happened in, in Southeast Asia, how does it affect the marketing strategies of your companies? 
Um, can I go first? Because I'll probably have a shorter version of this. Um, it's a massive impact. Uh, look, uh, for any of the marketers in the room or people, um, Google search remains my best ROI and it's different than his situation. Um, Facebook's massively important. We run our groups and things like that. Social commerce is a huge issue in Thailand, which is a huge um, trend in Thailand, which is everybody's like, hey, I can make two million baht a month from selling on Facebook. Thailand. That's what everybody is talking about. Um, it definitely has an impact on how we look at the world uh, in terms of Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Google. The line for me is not such a big topic. Um, and that's slightly different than a lot of other businesses. And the reason was, for marketing for us for Line was has been something that's really difficult. So um, since Line launched, they're like, "Do okay, well, we gotta come on." And I was like, "I don't know what I'm going to say to my users." I was like, "Hey, if I'm if I'm, you know, we love shopping. Who's in this building? Or if I'm if I'm Tarat or I'm love Lazada, I'm going to offer you coupons. I'm going to have this voice." For me, I have no inventory. I don't, I, I'm not gonna offer you a deal. I'm not gonna offer you a coupon. We have never been able to figure out how to use Lime effectively from our marketing standpoint um, because we don't know what we're gonna say to the audience. And one thing that Kaidi believes is, look, we just wanna be real with our audience and we don't wanna just sell you a bunch of bullshit. And so we've never been able to figure out how to approach Lime appropriately to be able to do that. And trust me, B, could be Ariat, who's now the MD of Line. We're talking about it all the time. I go, dude, I don't know what I'm going to do from a marketing point of view for us. But Facebook, very important. Instagram, a little bit less. Uh, Google, still massively important for us. So yeah, as Tima said, it's a little bit different for us. Uh, people rarely search for puzzle game with fruits. <laughs> <laughs> Really? That's not a popular keyword? <laughs> no. Like they search for games or they search for fun games or sexy games or anything else what they, what they want. So for us, we need to target specific users based on where you are, what your interests are, um, who your friends are, if they're actually playing the game or not. So Facebook for us is the major channel. It's where we spend the first money uh, to target user because we can go so deep segment into finding specific users in this part of the world that have these friends that have the common interest with these people because what we usually do is that we have a few million users that are spending money we take those users and we say to facebook we need more like this uh, and facebook is still the platform that knows most about their users which is the reason why it's the most targeted approach we can actually do um, Google for us is one out of 50 other networks. Uh, we of course do a lot of advertisement in other games. This goes from video ads to interstitials, but very little on AdWords. Mm -hmm. To go back to the questions of how social media boom has affected it, it's very uh, easy for us to target people since most people now on Facebook. It's a little bit more tough online because they don't allow us to do the same type of advertisement because you need to have Lion to actually publish your game and then to allow their integrations for you to be able to do it. So if you go with Lion, you can't really go with Facebook and the others. You need to only go with Lion. If you go with Facebook, you can go with everybody else. Uh, so for Thailand, Facebook is effective in the games. Uh, in Korea, we're working with Kakao. If you go to China, there is like 400 different app stores, so it's horrible. Uh, so I'm really, really happy that Line and Facebook actually came into Thailand early on because it means that we don't have to deal with 100 different partners, but instead two that can get us out to wide majority of people. The other thing is that he talked about some stats about cost per download, cost per install. For those of you thinking about doing an app or got your own startup, um, Facebook by far for Thailand, go there first. Do not think about spending your money anyplace else go to Facebook for your cost per install, you won't get a better deal anywhere in Thailand. So today, I mean, even for us, um, any Rocket people in the room? Anybody from Rocket Internet? Anyone, raise your hand, please. Nobody? No, X-Rocket. X-Rocket? Okay, Rocket, here's here. So Stein and I, 
talked about this. Um, look, our cost per install on Android for Kaidi is about, I think today it's around 15, 16 baht, um, per install. And it's nothing. Here's when we, and I'm not in gaming. Gaming is much more competitive. However, here's when I see my cost per install go up. It's when Rocket Internet, Lazada, starts spending. When they spend, my cost per install goes up. When they don't have the budget that month, my cost per install goes down. Do not, anybody tells you anything different, if you're thinking about doing an app, go to Facebook first. Do not go anyplace else. Okay, we get uh, quite some questions, and I think mainly our audience here is interested in job positions and internships that you provide. <laughs> um, so can you give us a, a general description of how the recruitment process works at ID and Playlab? Yes, uh, internship-wise, we do not have an internship process. We do not have specific job roles for you. It usually comes to interns applying, figuring out how smart you are and how passionate you are and where you would fit in the company and we put you there. Uh, again, I started working like in tech when I was 17. Uh, I, it, it didn't matter how old I was, it didn't matter how much experience I had and I really brought that with me. So I truly believe that no matter if you're an intern or a senior manager, that you can come up with the same ideas, uh, that you can come up with the same worth ethics. So internship at Playlab would be anywhere without the company. Not sure you can do an internship for the CTO, CEO. It would be really nice though. You can take a vacation. Yeah, I can take a vacation. Uh, but for most jobs around the company, we do open up for interns both here and in Manila. We do have a lot more interns in Manila because it's like half a year forced for everyone. It's a little bit less in Thailand, but I know that we are creating a specific internship program so we follow the exact procedure. Uh, but yeah, most interns are either from Thailand, from US, from Europe. It's not that big amount because it's very, we only want people that actually have the passion in it. Um, recruitment wise, send an email to jobs at playlab.com or to me, jlp at playlab.com. If you're smart, if you're passionate, I'm sure you can convince me so. Uh, look at our website, playlab.com. You have a full application process. You can see everything through. But in the end, I tend to hire smart people, even if we don't necessarily need you or have a specific job for you. I will find a way for you to help us and us to help you if you're smart and passionate enough or, yeah. That's pretty much it. And that's why he's never hired me. <laughs> um, <laughs> the internship. Um, so, uh, can I intern as a CEO? Uh, so, uh, I'll be honest, actually. Um, internships is something we've struggled with as a company. And I'm, I want to actually invite Gary to come up and talk a little bit to extend what I'm going to say. Um, we're keen for internships. I think, quite frankly, us as a company, we've managed them poorly. Um, and there's different levels of this. So I think in certain areas of the company, like marketing, uh, business development, uh, in our corporate team, which is finance, HR, um, legal, they've done a great job. Our biggest, our biggest struggle has been in tech, of how do we manage the internships in that area? Because it does require a specific um, specific skill set. I think as an organization we want to be better about this and we've been talking to AIP, AIP about this and how do we continue to develop our programs. Um, I hope we get better at this and I guess I just want to be honest with you guys like please apply, please come talk to us. Uh, you can talk, you can send in to HR at KID, you can send to me, ty.y at KID. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And particularly for the tech and design te designers in the room for um, internships, Gaz, would you spend a moment? Yeah. Hey, thanks. Um, I, th I think it's, it's, it's always been a challenge to bring an intern into a technical team. Um, but I, I, can, I tend to echo what you're saying. If you have the passion um, and you're smart, apply. We'll try and find some place for you. Uh, but our experience has been that it's a partnership 
And from Kaidi, we're, we're extremely focused on building the best kind of product we can. And sometimes it's kind of tough to find a place for someone who needs to learn. Because we're so busy just trying to move as fast as we can, getting something out the door as quickly as we can. Often, you know, we'll leave you behind and, and that's not fair. Uh, and that's been the biggest challenge, I think, around having interns in our team is it's just without having a proper curriculum or a proper structure, it ends up being wasteful for both parties. But um, as I said, I echo what Jacob said. I mean, I think apply, come talk to us. And, and really, if you, you step in the room and you've got passion and you're smart and you're, you've got drive, uh, we'll find something. There's no question about that. It's just where in the past we've, we've needed to kind of structure programs for you. That's challenging because that takes a fairly large amount of effort from HR and the rest of the team. And often we just don't have the bandwidth. So that's, that's fairly straightforward. Be really honest. Uh, just one very big tip. If you want to become intern in, I think, either companies, best approach, since you don't have a job title from the back, you don't have a history, you don't really have people uh, we can ask, and yes, we do not call you teachers, uh, make something truly awesome that you can showcase. If you, admire, if you are applying to a game company, make an awesome game. Uh, I tend to say your school projects doesn't count because you're kind of forced to do them. I've done a lot of school projects as, as well. If you're truly passionate about actually doing something in either gaming or in tech or in marketing, it means that you're also passionate about it in your free time. So in most cases, it means that you have also created something awesome in your free time that you can showcase. That's your best portfolio, no matter if you're a developer or a UX designer or in marketing. If you have created something passion, like awesome in your spare time, so it means you have passion, it means that you have much better chance of actually getting involved. The other thing is this, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, last year we had two interns. And these two interns came from Mosawa. And they met me in an inter in, at a networking event through one of their, like, Lun P. And one of, the, one of the two of them actually just called me. He happened to get my card, and he called me. And I was like, dude, I just called me. And he was like, yeah. I was like, so how can I help you? He was like, um, I wanted to ask P, uh, I want an internship. I was like, yes. That kind of confidence, love it. And these two interns were awesome. And, you know, they just integrated and they were here out of their passion. They wanted to be here. But I'll tell you, that, that willingness to try to take a step out, because to be honest, I got these two, I got his call. I was like, okay, what do I do with this? I was like, Katie, Katie, Katie. And I sent it to her. I was like, Katie, we got to hook these guys up. Because if they're willing to call me, from Mosa, Wa, Bing Kwan Thai, Dick I was like, dude, love it. That's awesome, because it shows their willingness to put themselves out there and try something different, and that's cool. So yeah, make something awesome, email it to me. If you want his phone number, email me as well. <laughs> I'll even give you recommendations to you. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Uh, we have a lot of more questions, but unfortunately we're already over schedule. But yeah, please stick around. Ty and Jacob will be here as well. Uh, so thank you for your time and thank you Jacob and Tiwa.